Hello there and welcome to Complete Games with me James. Hope you guys are all doing well and we're back with the story of Ark. In this little mini series we've been going over the Ark Survivor notes and we've already covered Helena Walker and Sir Edmund Rockwell. And in this two part episode we're going to be talking about Mei Ying. Mei Ying is a Chinese warrior and her notes are themed like ancient poems and written in a traditional Chinese. Now I can't translate Chinese, so I will be switching on Ark's translator as we go through the notes so you can read along as well. She appears to be from the Three Kingdoms era after referencing the Yellow Turban Rebellion. This rebellion took place about 200 years AD and was a peasant revolt in China against the Eastern Han Dynasty. Mei Ying's journey across the island map is an interesting one and she is perhaps one of my favourite survivors. So gather round, sit back and relax and enjoy. The Islands Explorer Notes from Mei Yin. Where am I? How did I arrive? I have asked these questions many times since I awoke on this foreign shore, but I must stop. They do not matter. Their answers will not serve me, so I will focus on a different question. How can I survive? This question always has an answer, though it's ever-changing, and it has helped me find resolve in moments of uncertainty or fear. Just days ago, I never thought I'd fear again. I thought my fear died with the yellow turbans. Yet when I see a great lizard turn its eyes on me, I know fear is exactly what I feel. I am armed and clothed now, though crudely. My stone spearhead makes me long for my village's weaponsmith, but it serves. I use it to hunt the slow, fat birds that wander the coast. I do not know how such creatures survive here at all, but I'm grateful for the meat they provide. I save my arrows for the more dangerous creatures, like the lizards with ears like fans, whose spit burns the things it touches. No, not just the creatures, they're not the only danger. Yesterday, I found footprints in the sand, and they were not my own. I'm not alone. Defending my hometown during the uprising taught me more in months than I have learned in all the years before it. Among those lessons, men will always underestimate women in battle, and humans can be crueler than any animal both applied today. The footprints I found were not from one man but three. Their eyes changed when they saw me, like wolves discovering a lamb. They were wrong. They were merely mutts. I was the wolf. Two died to arrows after ignoring my warnings. The last to my spear. I left their bodies out in the wild. I cannot stay here. The beaches are too open. To survive, I must brave the jungle. Today I scored a victory. As the sun set, I happened upon a small village on a bluff. Unfortunately, it was besieged by a man who rode a lizard like a horse and wielded a stick that spat fire. It would have been safer to retreat, but I could not ignore the bodies. This was a slaughter. Surprise can be a warrior's most powerful weapon, and I wielded it effectively. My first arrow found the lizard's throat, and many more pierced the man's back once he tumbled from his saddle. He never saw his vanquisher. In hindsight, I should have spared the beast. A mount would be welcome. The surviving villagers let me claim the lizard rider's armour and weapons, and gave me shelter for a night. To my surprise, I understood them. Their mouths moved strangely, but in my ears I heard the language of my home. They say it is the work of the metal object in my wrist, that I do not understand. But they had no reason to lie. That night, I dreamt of the uprising, but this time I was Lieutenant Guan, lifting the siege on my own village in a single gallant charge. Yet when I awoke, I was just Mei Yin. The villagers were gone. I am a stranger to them, but my heart feels heavier for their loss. I must carry on alone. The villagers have made taming beasts sound so simple, but my first attempt was nearly my last. My prey was the same kind of two-legged lizard as the rider's steed, what the villagers called a raptor, but this one was strong. Even as my toxic laced arrows knocked him out, he was able to make one final lunge for my arm. He nearly took it. Carefully, I fed him scraps of meat as he rested, and when he finally woke, I kept my weapon trained on him. Only when I was sure that he was docile did I notice his appearance. All black, save his white shins and feet. Right then, I named him Wu Shui, and while I do not believe in fate, I felt that this beast would carry me home. The raptors are improving. They know to follow Wu Shui, and Wu Shui knows to listen to me. Beasts without riders cannot maintain a formation, but they at least run close together. In time, they have even learned how to attack and retreat at my signal during our hunts on the plains. Together, Wu Shui and his five brothers are like a light cavalry unit, and I'm their commander. 
Unfortunately, they are all I really have. I'm not much of a craftsman and have few possessions. Not everyone here is like me though. There may be some who can craft, but cannot fight. Perhaps we could trade. The defense went spectacularly. Like many tribes, the Red Hawks relied entirely on brute force. They thought only of charging in with their beasts and their guns, with no regard for their surroundings. They never expected a sortie, much less one that came from their exposed flank. Our victory was so complete that my benefactors not only rewarded me with the weapons and supplies they promised, but extra pack animals to carry them. With each battle, my skills improve and my ranks swell, if only with beasts. I don't mind that. The people that I care about are back home, and until I return, Wushui is enough company. I was told this escort mission would be dangerous, but I had not expected to fight a legitimate army. Fortunately, I was riding ahead of the main column and spotted them first. After signalling for the convoy to change course, I harassed the enemy from their flanks to draw their attention, then retreated in a different direction. Even that cost me. Many of Wushui's brothers were injured, and some were killed. Previously, my enemies had fought wildly or even scattered when attacked, but these men had discipline. The leader of the convoy was very grateful. Apparently few survive an encounter with this new legion. I should be wary of them in the future. Am I a mercenary now? I had not given it much thought until I was actually called one. I don't like the title, mercenaries fight for riches, but I'm just fighting for what I need to survive. That's different, isn't it? When I fought back home, I knew who and what I was fighting for. I knew who the enemies were. Here I cannot tell. I'm trying to be honourable by defending the people and not attacking them. But how can I be certain? I cannot dwell on it. To survive, I must fight on. To return home, I must fight on. I've started to tame larger creatures. The speed of my light cavalry was beneficial but I realised that it was not enough. A hundred swift strikes mean nothing if there's no strength behind them. To survive enemies like this new legion, I must be able to strike with power. I began with the ones that looked like larger raptors, but with horns on their foreheads. They balance strength and speed well, and will serve well as the core of my forces. When I have enough horned raptors, I will add some giants. Maybe then I'll finally have enough strength to find a way home. I'm living on an island. Worse, a cursed island. I managed to tame a giant spine lizard and a giant raptor. I left the jungle to find a way out of these treacherous lands, but I soon found myself travelling in circles. Worse still, I'm told there's a magical barrier that prevents ships from sailing too far and birds from flying too high to leave the island. It was never a matter of strength. There is no path home at all. Wushui seems to sense my unease. These days, I often wake to find him nestled beside me. At least I'm not trapped here alone. I laugh for the first time in weeks today. A man from a small tribe of fishermen sought to hire me, but he didn't call me by my name. He called me the Beast Queen of the Jungle. I could not keep a straight face. I suppose I understand the title. Since my failed expedition, I've stalked out a small swath of land to live on more permanently, and the locals know it's my pack's hunting ground. Still, I'm hardly a queen. My castle is more like a little shack. I'd rather be called a queen than a mercenary though, so I may as well embrace it. I wonder what father would think of me now. Would he be proud of me when I march off to battle? I know he wanted a son. That's why he trained me in secret. Would he accept a beast queen instead? Mother wouldn't approve. The other villagers were too desperate to care about my gender when I joined the fight against the turbans but mother never forgave me. She wouldn't even look at me now. Should I mind? Those were Mei Yin's parents, from Mei Yin's life. And sometimes I wonder if that life was even real. Maybe I was always a beast and never a woman. I have finally found a beast that I cannot command. No, to call him beast is not enough. He's a demon. I was stalking a pair of giant raptors waiting for an opportunity to bring them into my pack. When he tore through the tree line to steal their kill, he dwarfed even the giant raptors in size. And in fury, he surely has no equal in this world. When his foes bit at him, his eyes glowed with hatred, and he struck with renewed vigour. I've never seen such terror. Even I dare not challenge this creature. If I'm the Beast Queen, then he is the Demon King. 
And that concludes part one of our Survivor Note read through from Mei Yin. In part two, we'll finish Mei Yin's story and find out what happened on the island. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe for more art content from myself. Leave a comment down below and tell me what you think of Mei Yin's story so far, and we'll continue this journey in part two. But until next time, I'm James from Complete Games, and I'll see you.